So, you want to know what the mark of the beast is. And in this video, you're going to find out. Now, I know you've heard many stories, many ideas, much speculation, a lot of conjecture on what the mark of the beast is. But in this video, we're going to use scripture and scripture alone to prove what the mark of the beast is. We learned about the mark of the beast in the Bible. Well, we're going to use the Bible in order to help us to understand what it is. Now, this is actually one of at least a few videos we'll do on the subject as we try to get this nailed down completely, making a concise video that everybody can learn what the mark of the beast is so that they can avoid it. And I ask for your help up front. I'm trying to remember all of the ideas that people have come up with as to what the mark of the beast is. We've heard that it's the 666. We've heard that it's the microchip in the hand. We've heard that it's the vaccine. But what other ideas have you come up with? What other ideas have you heard that could possibly be the mark of the beast? I would like to address each one of those in that future video, comparing each one to what we read in the book of Revelation so that we can eliminate all other ideas about what the mark of the beast is, except that what you're going to hear in this video. There are a lot of conflicting ideas and I plan to put each one of them to rest one by one. So drop down in the comment section even before you listen to the rest of this video and let me know your ideas or what you've heard about the mark of the beast. Even if you don't believe them, put them down there anyway, because somebody does. I ask you to do that now because by the time you get to the end of this video, you're going to know exactly what the mark of the beast is. So be sure to stick around to the end. Now here in the beginning, we're starting off with the book of Revelation chapter 13, which for most of us, this is the first time we've heard about the mark of the beast down there in about verse 17. But let's look back up there at verse 16, which says, and he calls if all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Now, I plan to cover new information in this video. And if you studied the mark of the beast at any length, you already know who it's referring to when it says he causeth. So I'll spare you all of the details on that because you can find that covered in many, many videos as they identify who this individual is or who this group of people is that's causing everybody to get the mark of the beast. We'll address it a little bit, but like I said, it's well known who that person is. What we really need to pull out of this verse is how the mark is in the right hand and on their forehead. That's our biggest clue other than who he is. The fact that it's in the right hand and or the forehead is gonna be our biggest clue as to what the mark of the beast is. The next place I want to bring you to is Revelation chapter 7 and verse 2, which says, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. Now this is our first clue as to what the mark of the beast is, except now it's talking about the seal of the living God. You see down in verse three that the servants of God were sealed in their foreheads. Now, like I said, verse two is a clue as to what the seal is, especially when you look at the new life version translation of the Bible. It doesn't call it a seal, but calls it the mark of the living God. So what this is telling us is that a seal and a mark is the same thing. So when we put this together, what we can understand is that both the servants of our father 
and those who serve the beast will have a mark in their foreheads. The World English Translation also calls it a mark of the living God. But notice that the Wycliffe Bible calls it a sign. Just as the Dawei Rhymes 1899 translation calls it a sign of the living God. So what we can gather from this is that a mark, a seal, and a sign are all pointing to the same thing. So it's easy to understand how the New Testament for everyone reads that the beast made everyone small and great, rich and poor, free and slaves to receive a sign from it. It says that this sign was marked on their right hands and on their foreheads. It's really important for us to understand how these words are used interchangeably so that we can recognize them when they're talked about in the Old Testament. Like back there in Exodus chapter 13, it's also talking about a mark on the forehead. Except here, instead of saying on the forehead, it says between the eyes. Let me just read verse 9. And it says, And it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thine hand, and for a memorial between thine eyes, that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth. For with a strong hand has the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. So here it is talking about a mark being placed on the forehead. But it's talking about the mark of our father. Just like in Revelation chapter 7. It's talking about the seal of the living God. Or the seal of our father in heaven. Hallowed be his name. You look at verse 16, it says, And it shall be for a token upon thine hand, and for frontlets between thine eyes. For by strength of hand the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt. So now it's saying the word token. But when we get over and we look at the interlinear Bible, we see that token is not used. And in its place, we find sign. So in other words, a token is yet another name for the word sign and mark and seal. So what is this sign that's being talked about? What is it saying? What is it? When we back up in chapter 13 and look at verse 6. It's talking about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And what we're being told is that the Feast of Unleavened Bread is the sign of the living God. So in other words, the Feast of Unleavened Bread or Passover, as some people like to call it, is the mark of our Father in Heaven on our foreheads, between our eyes and on our right hands. This is confirmed in 2nd Ezra chapter 2 when we see verse 38 says, Rise, stand, and see the number of those sealed at the feast, those who have transferred themselves from the shadow of the world and received bright garments from the Lord. What this is telling us is that the sealing process that we read about over in Revelation chapter 7 occurs at the feast. Here are a couple of other translations of verse 38, which is telling us that we receive the seal of the living God during the feast of the Lord. And now that we've established what the sign of our father is, we can easily figure out what the sign of the beast is or what the mark of the beast is. If the sign of the living God is the Feast of Unleavened Bread or Passover, then the mark of the beast would be the opposite. And what is the opposite of Passover? Easter, which 
under the instruction of the Catholic Church back in the Council of Nicaea, replaced Passover after they abolished it. In other words, during that Council of Nicaea, they forbade the practice of keeping Passover and insisted that the believers would follow Easter instead. In fact, that's what the council was all about, was establishing Easter as the holiday of the faith and making anybody who followed Passover the target of persecution. Persecution even unto death and under the Emperor Constantine, who went on to ban the use of the sacred calendar or the biblical calendar altogether. This government figure made it against the law to follow the biblical calendar altogether. In fact, the Gregorian calendar that we use today was created in 1582 by Pope Gregory just to calculate Easter. That's what that calendar is all about. That's why they got a new calendar in 1582 altogether. That calendar was created so that they could recalibrate the date of Easter. In other words, it is a Easter calendar. Now, I know what you're thinking. And that is Hillel too created a Jewish calendar. But what you have to understand is that Hillel too modified the calendar. He changed the biblical calendar because it was outlawed by Constantine. Hillel too created a whole new calendar system, a way of determining dates. And when you look at the dates according to the Jewish calendar, they're always wrong. They don't calculate the dates the same way. And so the dates for Passover as calculated according to the scripture and the way the Jewish calendar calculates the dates are different, usually by a day or two. But in some cases, like you're looking at over here at this table that I formulated, many times the date of Passover is missed altogether. Let me let me show you what I mean. We're looking at the dates on the Jewish calendar from 2010 to the year 2030. These are the dates that are given. For instance, if you were to put into Google when it's Passover or Shavuot, which is Pentecost or Yom Kippur, these are the dates that you will be given. But when you compare these to the way the biblical calendar is calculated, you see that in many years, they missed the date altogether. Like, for instance, in 2010, when all of the feast days for the year were off by a whole month. In fact, each one of these lines that you see, like 2013, 2018, 2021, 2026, and 2029, the Jewish calendar gets every feast day off by a month. They have the people celebrating all of the feasts for that year in the wrong month. And then other years like 2015 and 2023, even though they get the spring feast correct, the fall feasts are off by a month. In other words, in the year 2023, which is supposed to be the year that all financial debts are released for the children of Israel, those following the Jewish calendar won't be counted in that number because they're following the Hillel II calendar, the Jewish calendar, and they will be celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles, which is a time of release in the wrong month. They're going to celebrate it a month too early. What's interesting, like for instance, when you look in the year 2024, which is a Jubilee year, they will be getting the feast days correct in the right month. And you see here that during 2024, there are no highlights for the entire year. 
That's what I believe the Messiah was talking about when he said an acceptable year of the Lord. In that year, not only will the feast days fall in the correct months, but that will be one of the only years when Easter does not fall during the Feast of Unleavened Bread like it normally does with all of these orange spaces. Every time you see one of these orange blocks here, Easter falls during the week of unleavened bread, which like we read about over in the book of Exodus takes away your seal because that is leavening for those who keep Easter. But then notice that Halloween in that year does not fall during tabernacles like it does in these other years. And Christmas does not fall during the week of Hanukkah like you see highlighted in this column here. But notice that's the only year that does that. Every other year, either there's a pagan festival that falls during the high holy days or the feasts are completely off altogether. Not to mention Shavuot or Pentecost, which is off every single year because they celebrate it a week too early as they determine it based on Easter and not the Feast of First Fruits like they're supposed to. This is the Jewish calendar. This is the calendar of the government. And those who follow the Jewish calendar will not have the seal of our Father in their foreheads because they're not celebrating the feast days on the right day. But is this calendar itself the mark of the beast? No. This is only the calendar of the beast. What is the mark of the beast? Easter. Easter, just like the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is the mark of our father, the holiday of Easter is the mark of the beast. Those who keep Easter have the mark of the beast. That's what it is. 